In the middle of the 18th century, under the rule of King Fernando VI, a major reform of the state begins. The navy is the key to the Spanish colonial rule, and it needs a technological renovation in order to compete against England. The struggle for global hegemony is disputed in the seas. The Gulf of Roses, two centuries later. An archaeological expedition is aimed at studying the vestiges of a great ship found in its waters. Thetis, the boat from the Center for Underwater Archaeology of Catalonia, is the base of operations for the excavation. This time, it is very close to the coast, in front of the beach of San Pera Pescador, in the site that could be that of the Triumphante, a Spanish ship of the line that sank at the end of the 18th century. The excavation of the Triomfante was carried out during the years 2008, 2009 and 2010. The goal was to carry out a study of naval architecture. We knew that the ship was built using the system of Jorge Juan and we wanted to study, through archaeology, this constructive system. It had never been done before and we had the fortune of having a boat built with this system sunk in the Gulf of Roses. If this is actually the Triumphante, it will be the first study of a ship built following the groundbreaking designs of one of the most important ship designers of the 18th century. The memory of the existence of the Triumphante was present among the fishermen and divers from the Gulf of Roses. But the archaeological institutions began to be aware of this archaeological site in the beginning of the 1980s, when some local divers communicated it to the Centre for Underwater Archaeology of Catalonia. However, many years before communicating the presence of the ship to the archaeologists, local fishermen were already aware of its existence in the Gulf of Roses. Three friends from Roses had a leading role in its discovery, Salvador Guerra, Paco Falcó, and Carlos Paramo. In the 1950s, my father talked with the fishermen from Roses in order to point out all the sunken ships in the bay which they knew because of the hooks. And then a fisherman from San Pere Pescador told him about the Triumfante. He already knew that the ship was the Triumfante and gave the signs to my father. Then we started to check history books and my father realized that the Triumfante was a very important ship belonging to the Admiral Gravina. With the help of a colleague from Rosas, the son of a historian and collector, 
he'd found plans and objects at home. And after discussing it with his father, he told me that it was possible that an important ship from the Spanish Navy was sunken there, on the beach. So one day we took a small plane and we examined the entire bay. And then, over the beach, we saw a large dark patch. And we thought that it could be the Triomfante. At that time, fishermen or divers like myself had no GPS or similar devices. So we had to use signs on the ground. We took some signs from the small plane and then we went to sea with one of my fishing boats and we were stunned by what we saw there. There were plenty of cannons. We counted about 14. There was even one that was stuck vertical and I said, this will be useful to moor the boats. The first news I had of the Triumphante is related to my long-standing friendship with Salvador Guerra. His father, Esteba Guerra, had documented all the hooks that the fishermen were reporting as elements that hindered the tasks of trawling and setting the nets and fishing lines on the sea bottom. Miquel Oliva y Prat, official archaeologist of the Diputación de Girona, asked Salvador to take photographs of the elements from the plane. One element was the country house Mas Castellà in Pontos, where the excavations had discovered some important Iberian archaeological remains. And the other element was a ship, the Triumfante, in front of San Martí de Ampurias, which could be exactly located from the plane, as before that time we didn't know for sure where it was located. Salvador Guerra asked me if I could take photos of these two important elements with my camera, and so we did. This site was already known. We knew that there was a big sunken ship in front of San Pedro Pescador. And, thanks to the sign of Paco Falco and Salvador Guerra, we relocated the ship and started the excavation works. Many of the sunken ships in the Costa Brava have been plundered. Tourism and lax legislation made these boats an easy prey until the 80s of the 20th century. El Triomfante, very close to the coast, is a paradigm of this plundering. When we located the ship again in 2008, we found a spectacular ship, a large vessel with all its building systems, but at the same time, a very plundered ship. Just consider that it was a ship with 68 cannons, and we have only been able to document a single cannon during the three excavation campaigns. The Triomfante has been the target of neighbors, tourists, and above all, collectors from all over Europe eager to get their hands on all of its objects. For years, it suffered from plundering, and despite the Board of Underwater Archaeology of Girona's Maritime Province requesting more surveillance, and even applying for a license for archaeological intervention at the site, the problem was not resolved. Amateur divers kept on plundering it. During the 60s and 70s, the wreck of the Triunfante suffered an intensive extraction of archaeological material by local fishermen and divers. In the early 80s, archaeological expeditions knew about the existence of this ship, and a first prospecting was carried out using a new electronic device which had just been purchased, a magnetometer, that allowed the ship to be located with precision. 
The first time Salvador and I touched the Triumfante with our hands, we were going through the beach with all the equipment and swimming from the shore to the ship in quite precarious conditions. When we dived there, we saw some sort of hole and we could touch some Roman numerals. We saw that it was evidently the prow. In the same way, exploring the site with our limited equipment, we saw the stern. We saw a bronze piece finished in the shape of a sphere standing out of the sand. And later we learned that it was the Stern's lantern. Later on, in 1977, we carried out regular visits to check the state of the wreck. And we always found people, tourists, swimming over there. And we realized that the ship was being plundered. It was then that myself, Falco, and several local divers decided to communicate it to the city council. We went there, recovered two cannons, and delivered them to the city council. The cannons are now in the Citadel of Roses. Every time we went there, we extracted one cannon. Well, we got four cannons in five, six, or seven explorations. I don't know exactly. We often went there because we like to be there, in that environment. It is very exciting for a diver to be over a ship with cannons. We enjoyed that a lot. But we stopped taking cannons because we also noticed that no one in the town specified what had to be done with those cannons. And I said that they were going to get lost. I saw how some of them ended up in a public library, so I thought that maybe they were better conserved under the water and we could always go there to see them. Until the 1970s, a sunken ship was considered a deposit of archaeological material and it was thought to belong to the discoverer. With the arrival of sport diving from the 1950s, a trafficking business of archaeological pieces began, and some of them were auctioned abroad. When you realize that a piece you've touched, and that you think it is very important and well protected by mud, by nature, has been auctioned in Germany, it generates a feeling of frustration, although it is a frustration already felt many years ago the conscience that we were living in a very backward country, that authorities are indolent and don't take responsibility of protecting our heritage. It creates a feeling of helplessness. It is sad that our country does not care for what is part of our history. The change of mentality took place at the end of the 70s. In the early 80s, when the sunken ship began to be seen as a historical document, Therefore, as a crucial and essential instrument in order to know our history and therefore our culture. And so, as a historical document, it's of public ownership. In 1974, the first official intervention in the ship was performed. The Navy Diving Centre brought the salvage vessel Poseidon in order to explore and evaluate the archaeological remains. Later on, in 1974, the Poseidon ship came and carried out the first campaign over the Triumfante. At that time, I used to have a Land Rover, and I remember that I helped them providing materials from the beach because they had to use machines, and many things had to be carried from the beach because the boat was close to it. The Poseidon was a tugboat with a depth of five meters, and the Triumfante was four meters deep. And for this reason, Poseidon could not reach it, nor be placed over the site. I supported them by guiding them to the site, teaching them everything I had seen, and then helping them with my fishing boats, carrying people and objects that had to be moved from the small boat to the ship. And this was our support. Archaeology has clearly shown us the plundering that the ship has suffered over the years. We have to bear in mind that the entire prow was torn off. We could even document the nails that were used to fix it. 
The whole area of the mast was also torn off, probably to preserve materials of the compartment of explosives, which we were easily able to document. Archaeology showed the great harm that the wreck of the Triomfante has suffered. We were invited to be there. We thought we were privileged. We saw the entire operation as an absolutely professional occasion, and naturally we felt the thrill of seeing a big piece emerging. We didn't know if they tore it off or if it was part of a loose piece. We had no idea. They extracted that piece in the same way that the cannons were extracted. It was a pity that the Stern's Langturn was not extracted as well. After exhibiting the foresight stem and the rest of the pieces in Cartagena in June 1975, the Navy gave them to the Maritime Museum of Barcelona. But what was the Triumphante doing in Roses? What was the reason behind its tragic ending? January 1795. The war of the convention between Spain and the revolutionary France began one year ago. The French armies have occupied Figueras and they are besieging the Citadel of Roses. The only support comes from the sea, where a naval squadron commanded by Lieutenant General Federico Gravina is trying to break the siege. For several weeks, the squadron has endured numerous storms and battles that have produced much damage on the ships. One of these ships is the Triomfante. The night of January the 5th to the 6th, 1795, they experience the largest storm and the Triumphante loses its mooring lines and has to seek refuge in the open sea since it doesn't have any anchor left. It's Captain. Vincente Yanez is not on board. He's in Federico Gravina's ship and the captain in charge decides to seek refuge on the high seas. The wind and the storm push it along the coastline of the Gulf of Roses. And he finds that the course takes the ship towards the coast in Montgri, a rocky coastline where the ship and crew will almost inevitably be lost. Therefore, the solution is to run aground on the beach of San Pere Pescador. On the morning of January 6th, 1795, Ravina sees from Roses how the Triumfante has run aground on the beach of San Pere Pescador and commands that everything must be disembarked from the ship, cannons, ammunition, etc. As the Triumfante was sinking, the army began to recover every possible thing. Vessels and carriages carried the objects and weapons were brought to Cartagena, and thus the ship was abandoned. With the abandonment of the ship, a process of degradation began. Storms, sea organisms, and the inhabitants of the area were the main causes. Slowly, the sea swallowed it. The ship suffered significant plundering during the 60s and 70s. Furthermore, this ship is six meters deep, run aground in the sand, and this means that the storms cover and uncover it with sand, which generates mechanical effect on the remains. The plundering and the mechanical effect left the ship in deplorable conditions in the details, but Despite this fact, it preserved its entire structure, virtually its entire length and breadth. During the excavation, more precisely on December 26th of the year 2008, a very strong storm occurred along the entire coastline of Catalonia. 
and it moved all the sediment, all the sand of the seabed. In the year 2009, when we went to do the field work, we found that two meters of sand had settled over the site where we had worked the previous year. To get to the site and reach the archaeological level, we had to use some industrial dredgers in order to remove the great volume of sand and to be able to document the ship, which had been so easy to work on the year before. In order to remove the vast amount of sand, the archaeologists used an industrial dredge adapted to archaeological work. In this way, they drew out the three meters of sediments and deposited them far from the site. It took nearly two weeks of digging to reach the remains of the ship. Working six hours a day, two teams of four archaeologists collaborated to operate the dredge that had to extract all the sand from the site. When the first remains appeared, they began to work with suction hoses. These hoses enable the sediments that cover the architecture of the ship to be carefully removed in order to discover the archaeological objects. They are also necessary to keep the site free of the sand that the sea currents deposit. In terms of field work, this ship allowed us to perform a lot of teamwork, as it is a very big vessel. And what we did was to remove the sediments that covered the remains we wanted to study, as any archaeologist would do, and then document them. These two teams worked together, one removing the sediments and the other documenting the objects, since the size of the ship allowed us to do that. At the Center for Underwater Archaeology of Catalonia, we work with suction hoses. The technique is very simple. From the ship Thetis, pressured air is sent to the working depth level. This air reaches the working depth level and reaches an expansion chamber. And this air, as you know, increases its volume when it loses depth. If we lock this ascending air inside a tube, we generate the stream of suction that we need to remove the sediment. The suction hose system runs this way. We need to direct this suction, and for that we use a flexible tube, which helps us to direct the suction and thus extract the sediment within the site. Now that you've seen how suction hoses work, let's see the Triunfante, the ship where we'll work today. We'll make two diving groups, a first team in which Roberto, Kike and Paul will work. An hour and a half of work. 
and a second shift, Maria Jose, Adria, Edu and me. Also an hour and a half of work, okay? We have two suction hoses. We'll put one at the junction between the frames and the Orlop deck. They are, as you know, the original floor of the ship's hold. Then we'll unload the sediment far from the site, facing the port side, okay? And another hose will clean the spaces between the frames. Here we must clean very carefully, as if we find archaeological material, it will be precisely right here, in these spaces between the frames. Always start from the keel and work towards the ends of the boat. Okay? The Triumphante is a ship from the Enlightenment period, a ship that was launched in 1755 as a result of a new policy of the Spanish state, which was aware that the Spanish Armada had become obsolete. The renewal plan of the Navy minister, Marquez de la Ensenada, counted on the best scientists in the country. Among them, the most prominent was Jorge Juan y Santa Cilia, known in Europe as the Spanish Sage. Jorge Juan was considered the most important Spanish scientist of the 18th century. Member of the Order of Malta and trained at the Academy of Marine Guards of Cadiz, he was an engineer, a mathematician and a great navigator. In the year 1749, Marques de la Ensenada, Minister of Finance and the War of King Fernando VI, commissioned Jorge Juan, a delicate espionage mission in the British arsenals. He sent scale models, drawings, books and machinery from London, but above all, he recruited 80 English and Irish technicians for the Spanish crown. These people with their families moved clandestinely to Spain in order to work in the new naval program. During his espionage mission in London, Jorge Juan adopted different identities. The first known identity is that of a French bookseller called Monsieur Sublevant. The second, that of a Sephardic Jew, Mr. Joshua. And the third would probably be that of a Menorcan sailor. And at that time, Menorca was under British rule. Jorge Juan introduces a new way of conceiving and building ships in Spain. And the Triumfante is one of the first vessels created with this new philosophy, with this new naval engineering knowledge, largely imported from England. So it marks a milestone for shipbuilding in Spain. Jorge Juan's design of ships is his own design. But, in fact, one might speak of a hybridization of Spanish and English dimensions and shapes. It is the result of his espionage mission in England, but also of his dialogues with Ricardo Ruth. In order to develop his designs, Jorge Juan had the collaboration and experience of Richard Ruth. This important builder, recruited in London, became the director of naval construction in the shipyards of Ferrol. Jorge Juan conceived the Triumfante ship based on the English model, and this is the great contribution of this ship. However, the infighting and the political situation meant that later on this English project also adopted contributions from the French and Spanish naval tradition. 
There are details that are not reflected in the documentation. For example, the arrangement of the tree nails to attach the frames with the skin, or for example, the way the keel is built as archaeology documents it. The documentation of the Triumphante had two aspects. On one side, the documentation of a large ship, one of the biggest ships studied in the country. And at the same time, it had to be a very precise dossier, as we wanted to fully understand Jorge Juan's constructive system. And we need to keep in mind that this ship was built in 1755, but sank in 1795 and Jorge Juan's system was used for a short time, especially during the time of construction of the ship. So we had to research how the early system of the boat was. At the same time, during its active life, some parts of it were remanufactured at the dock of Cartagena. So we also had to document them archaeologically and separate them from Jorge Juan's constructive system. For the scale presentation or planimetry, they first marked the parts of the ship. This marking allowed them to have a reference that identifies and distinguishes each of these pieces. A manual drawing method was chosen for planimetry. This was done using a drawing structure, a frame of 6 meters by 4 meters, which covers an area of 24 square meters. This allows the simultaneous work of two archaeologists carrying out the floor plan. In the case of sections and elevations, which along with the floor plan give us the three-dimensional information about the remains of the ship, we used an underwater laser system. This is a similar system to the one used on land, but applied to the aquatic environment. The main problem was the large size of this wreck about 50 meters of preserved length by more than 10 meters breadth. This makes a study area of 670 square meters that required moving the drawing frame 28 times. Subsequently, all this documentation manually compiled in the field is digitized and vectorized using a computer drawing program. This allows later on to study the naval architecture and to create three-dimensional reconstructions of the ship. Zenit photography was also used as a complement to the manual drawing method. We photographed all the vestiges of the ship with metric references. This enabled us to compose a photo mosaic of the entire site. In addition, detailed photographs of distinctive or characteristic items were also taken. 200 years later, some items still remain at the site. One of the challenges will be their recovery. Between the timbers of the hold's floor, one of the archaeologists has found the remains of a musket. A layer of buildup produced by the interaction of iron's corrosion and sea organisms covers the weapon and keeps it attached to the wood. must be extracted very carefully. At the same time, the second group of archaeologists continues the planimetry of floor plans and sections. The archaeologists accurately hit the layer of build-up in order to separate the musket from the wood. 
sudden movement could break it. Once detached, it is immobilized for transport. Using a lifting balloon, two archaeologists bring the musket to the surface. When it reaches the port, one of the most delicate moments of the excavation begins, the transport of archaeological material. Once extracted from the site, the pieces should be always kept in water. Momentarily for the transfer, some objects can be removed from the water, but they should be kept moist until their arrival at the laboratory. Most people think that our archaeological work is mainly underwater, but in fact, it's divided into three stages. Field work, when we indeed work underwater, which is 40% of the total archaeological work. The laboratory work, and then the library research and study of the pieces, which completes the work. Put it upside down, the big on the top, that's it. The laboratory of the Center for Underwater Archaeology of Catalonia, located in Girona, is a model for the study and restoration of archaeological pieces. Here, the restorers carry out different processes of restoration of the different objects found during the excavation campaigns. At the Triumphante, we have found various objects from the crew, weapons, or objects belonging to the ship. There are organic objects, such as wood, leather, and ropes, and non-organic objects, such as iron, bronze, and lead. Archaeological objects arrive at the lab with different problems. Due to the long period of time that they have been submerged, some are covered with a layer of very hard buildup, or have encrustations of different intervertebrate organisms that cover its surface. The Teredo navalis, one of these intervertebrates, are mollusks that live in the wood and perforate it, creating large limestone galleries that destroy the structure of the ships. The conservators carry out a chemical and mechanical cleaning of the parts in order to remove the deposits on its surface. They use different cleaning instruments from precision tools to household objects. Pieces remain submerged for months in freshwater tanks where the conservators get information about the desalinization process through regular checks of the salt concentration. The salt accumulated over so many years will slowly dissolve.
archaeological wood after centuries under the sea has lost all the cellulose that originally held its structure. Now, only water retains the shape of the wood. Organic materials are preserved until the present time because they are saturated with water. If we remove them from the water, they suffer irreversible degradation. Using different techniques, the conservators perform a controlled drying in order to ensure the preservation of the piece and its subsequent exhibition in museums. One of the procedures for drying organic materials such as wood is lyophilization. Archaeological pieces are frozen and later introduced into a vacuum chamber where the frozen water of the piece goes from the solid state to gaseous state through a sublimation process. This way, the shape of the object is preserved. Another conservation process is the PEG saturation. The pieces are immersed in a solution of water and synthetic wax, polyethylene glycol, to a temperature close to 60 degrees Celsius. The concentration of this wax will be increased gradually. Thus, the resulting solution replaces the water inside the wood and preserves the shape of the object. For the treatment of the ferrous materials of the Triumphante, they use electrolysis, which consists in applying low-voltage electricity through the piece in order to remove the layer of buildup and stop the oxidation process. Once the different processes of restoration and conservation are completed, the objects extracted from the Triomfante are ready to be exhibited. Jorge Juan creates a new construction system based on the combination of the English building system and the French-Spanish building system. It's a different building system that takes the best of each technique and makes a revolution, creating different and better ships within the building tradition of the 18th century. The English construction details, breaking up with the Spanish tradition, are, on the one hand, the joints of the different pieces in the keel, changing its horizontal disposition into a vertical one. The addition of a great piece that goes from the prow to the stern on the top of the keel, which is called dead wood. The removal of the empty spaces between the frames, resulting in a much more solid and compact construction and also of the spaces between the different elements of a frame. The addition of filler pieces that they call choques. Theoretically speaking, we can indeed see these big differences. But what we aimed to do in our study of the Triumphante was to understand, archaeologically, at the practical level, how this construction system was implemented. Other construction details are the half timber in the prow and the stern, instead of floor timbers from the stern, big pieces in the shape of a V, and then above all, the use of tree nails instead of iron nails to secure the sheathing of the hull, the most criticized object by Spanish builders. It was difficult to implement Jorge Juan's construction system in the Spanish shipyards. We should bear in mind that Jorge Juan brought a group of British shipbuilders from England, many of them Irish, who only spoke English or Gaelic, but not any language of the Iberian Peninsula. This made it very difficult to explain the methods of the new construction systems to the master builders, who were working on the ships with their own hands. 
This system mainly followed an English construction system. So it used tree nails to attach the pieces. And the master builders of the Spanish shipyards were used to working with nails. The union of wood with wood was not typical of the Iberian Peninsula. Originally, and following the English construction technique imported by Jorge Juan, the most important pieces of the Triomfante were attached by tree nails and can still be found at the site. Political and technical changes caused the replacement of these tree nails with iron nails in some parts of the ship. The iron nails have disappeared due to oxidation but regularly distributed holes allow us to detect them. To make the planimetry easier, we had to highlight them using marking elements. Jorge Juan's general design was not criticized. In principle, it was good. So the targets of the criticism were the English constructive details. Why? Because they break up with the Spanish tradition of construction. The maestranza, the union of the master builders, had to get used to a new way of building. The study of the vessel shows that the Triumphante was conceived using the English model, but also that throughout the construction process and during the 40 years of its life until the sinking in 1795, it underwent significant changes. Both, as I said, during the construction and hull shaping, as well as after the reforms made throughout its active life, some in Cartagena, for example, they added a copper sheathing. Important parts of the wooden sheathing were changed, as well as some structural parts. Archaeology shows this development both regarding the concept and the maintenance of the ship. Why was a system that provided important technical innovations not consolidated? What happened? Why did it fall into disuse? In mid-1754, Marques de la Ensenada falls out of favor, and the critics of the minister and of the English construction system try to change this new structural tradition in Spain. Therefore, in 1755, the changes begin, a reversion back to the Spanish methods, and an abandonment of some English practices. And above all, in the year 1763, François Gautier arrives from France to take charge of Spanish shipbuilding, and he removes all English practices and imposes the French methods of construction. With the fall of the Marquis, Jorge Juan and his naval program will be progressively discarded. Faced with this situation, he decides to go back to Cadiz, and resume his duties as the director of the Academy of the Marine Guard. The Triumphante is a failed project of the Enlightenment. It's a project that sought to build a new Spanish Armada with completely new techniques, essentially imported from England. And that, however, was not accomplished because it became a hybrid work of French and Spanish systems of construction. Underwater archaeology identified which of its parts belonged to each of these traditions. The problem of this construction system was its implementation. We have to consider that it was a progress that people of that time were probably not prepared to accept. Today, the Triumphante remains protected by sea sediments. Even so, there are still many sites to explore on our coast. 
many ships. Many stories that are waiting to surface again someday.